Hi, welcome to Live at State, the State Department's interactive web chat platform for engaging international media. I'm your host, Holly Jensen, and I would like to welcome all of you joining us today. I would like to send a special shout out to those of you joining us at our 20 watch parties in 18 countries hosted by our embassies and posts around the continent. As you know, Assistant Secretary Linda Thomas-Greenfield is here today, and she will be discussing U.S. policy in Sub-Saharan Africa. But what you don't know is she is joined by Secretary of State John Kerry, who has come by to say a few words about our U.S. policy and the importance of our relationship with Africa. He's also graciously agreed to take one question before he departs. As you know, he's a very, very busy man. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being the first ever Secretary of State to join us on Live at State. Wow, I didn't realize that. I'm very excited by that. Great. Thank you. Thanks, great. Holly. I'm great. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm very happy to be uh, joining all of you. Thanks for being part of this incredible network of uh, watch parties. And it's my privilege to be here with our terrific Assistant Secretary of State, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who is uh, firefighting in lots of different places. She's doing an incredible job um, of uh, reaching out and trying to help us to end some conflicts where they exist and prevent them where they might be uh, starting. And, and there are huge challenges. But what is happening in Africa is so exciting overall, and we are really deeply uh, engaged and, and, and the president uh, has instructed us uh, to really try to uh, light our fire under our efforts uh, in, throughout the continent. Uh, when you look at it and you think that over the course of the next 20, 30 years, uh, half the workforce or a quarter of the workforce of the world, I guess it is, is going to wind up coming from Africa, being in Africa. And 60% of the population under the age of 30 presents us not just with an enormous challenge because we need to provide education, we need to provide opportunity, but it also uh, provides us with uh, the chance to really define the future. And that's what we're trying to do with our programs like Trade Africa, uh, with our Power Africa initiative, with the Young African Leaders Initiative. All of these things are exciting. Uh, the president is, is very committed to trying to build on this through the African summit that's coming down the road. I just say very quickly that um, I've been personally involved uh, in the issues of uh, the Central African Republic, where we are trying to build the capacity to deal with the violence. Uh, in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, we have a special envoy. Russ Feingold has done a superb job working with Mary Robinson. Uh, we've been able to secure the framework agreement that uh, uh, recently came out of Kampala and that will now uh, reduce the violence, we hope, with the disarming of M23 and hopefully create an agenda going forward around which we can develop and build capacity. And then, of course, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, an enormous challenge. We've been deeply engaged there. Again, we have a special envoy. We've worked very, very hard. I've personally been on the telephone with uh, President Kier, uh, with former Vice President Rick Machar, uh, with the Ethiopians, uh, with the Ugandans and others in efforts to try to uh, prevent the uh, deterioration which only impacts uh, the people uh, of uh, South Sudan. Uh, and we want to avoid going back to what was once the longest war in the history of Africa. So there are many, many challenges. And I can just say to all of you on a personal level, I think many of you know, my uh, wife was born in, uh, in Mozambique, and what, what is uh, now Maputo is where she lived. Uh, and she was educated in uh, South Africa, in Johannesburg, and uh, in Durban, actually. Um, and uh, I recall myself going back there with her and just visiting uh, uh, up in the mountains uh, a, a school where we were engaged in trying to uh, prevent AIDS and deal with people who had it. It was a very moving experience for me. Uh, we've made enormous progress, a huge reduction in the incidence of, age. We, of AIDS. We may be able to have the first generation of uh, children born AIDS-free as a result of our efforts. There's been a 40-fold increase uh, in the provision of antiretroviral drugs. So it's, a, it's an amazing story, uh, and I think it's a measure of the full engagement of the United States uh, and all of us in trying to help Africa 
to define its own future in the way that it wants to, but to give the lift necessary to do that. So my privilege to be here with Linda, and I apologize that I can only stay for one question, but we have the French President Hollande visiting, and I need to go over to the White House for our meeting. So thank you. Great. The first question and only question comes from Latif Mukasa from Record TV, and he would like to know, what is the U.S.'s interest in South Sudan, and what's the way forward for peace to prevail? Well, the United States has always been interested in South Sudan, uh, regardless of administration label, Republican or Democrat alike. Uh, you know, uh, former Senator John Danforth spent a great deal of time at President Bush's uh, designation to help create the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the CPA. And uh, I personally became engaged there because I was struck by the fact that so many people had died, maybe as many as two million people in what was Africa's longest war. Uh, here we had a young nation uh, that, uh, or an aspiring nation at that time that wanted its independence. That's part of the American story. It's something we respect, the, the democracy, the opportunity to be able to um, define your own future. And so we were very supportive of that. I personally visited, I was personally involved. Uh, I was there the day of the referendum. Uh, we, we, we feel invested. We also feel deeply committed, uh, given past lessons, to try to prevent the chaos and the, the, the genocide that too often comes with the violence that can, that can occur if things break down. We all have an interest, and everybody has an interest, in not letting that happen. So here we have this new nation that is already in extremis, and we helped give birth to it. We feel, you know, this is a part of our responsibility. And we, we don't want this to cascade into a more violent uh, repetition of the past. So that's why we're committed. We, we, we believe this is part of the defining of the future of Africa. And we will remain deeply committed uh, and personally engaged in an effort to try to uh, help the people of South Sudan to find their own future in peace and prosperity, hopefully. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. I know you have to make your way out. I do have to run. I apologize. Thank have you fun. So much for joining You're going to have a great time. Thank you. I don't know how don't I can follow you, but thank you all off. very much. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. As the Secretary makes his way out of the, out of the studio, I would just like to remind you, if you'd like to continue this conversation, you can do so by following the Secretary on his brand new Twitter account, at John Kerry, using the hashtag USAfrica. And before I turn it over to Assistant Secretary Linda Thomas-Greenfield, I'd just like to remind you, you can start asking your questions now in the lower left-hand portion of your screen, titled Questions for State Department Official. If you have any problems, you can always email your questions into live at state.gov and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can in the time we have. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Assistant Secretary. Thank you so much. You are very, very popular. Well, thank you so much. I think my popularity has diminished having uh, the Secretary participate. Uh, I think I uh, join all of the audience in, in thanking him for joining us today. Uh, the Secretary's presence uh, is an indication of how uh, strong his interest is in uh, Africa and on the African continent. Uh, so again, I look forward to taking your questions and uh, hearing what your concerns are. Our first question is from Horizon News. President Barack Obama has invited 47 African presidents for a high-level meeting next August in Washington. One, what kind of subjects will be discussed during that meeting? And two, what are the opportunities that await Sub-Saharan Africa for the remainder of the President Obama's term? Good. Thank you. That's a great question to start with. Uh, the President did announce uh, a couple of weeks ago the Heads of State Summit that uh, we will be hosting here in Washington in August of, of this year. We are in the process of consulting with our uh, partners on the African continent. Uh, to determine what uh, issues uh, they are interested in discussing during the summit. Uh, I was in Addis uh, last week for the AU summit, and I also met with uh, African ambassadors here in Washington prior to going out to Addis. And we have heard uh, a number of issues uh, come forward. Peace and security is high on their agenda and is likely to be one of the subjects on, on our agenda. We also heard uh, an interest in 
uh, talking about uh, issues related to democracy and governance. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that one of the issues that we uh, intend to have on the agenda, and I think there's a lot of excitement on the continent, is the Young African Leaders uh, Initiative and how we deal with uh, the youth, youth bulge that is uh, taking place on the African continent. Uh, I think it goes without saying, and you know as well, uh, how significant the youth population is on the continent. I've seen figures as high as 60% of the population under the age of 25. So that's going to be uh, a topic for discussion that the president is excited uh, to share with, uh, with his uh, counterparts on the continent. Our next question comes from Korka Ba. During the AU summit in Addis, Ethiopian Prime Minister called for urgent action to avoid the further escalating of violence between Christians and Muslims in Central African Republic. What actions does the U.S. take to help Africa in this conflict that has led to a humanitarian crisis? We are deeply concerned about the situation in CAR. As uh, you may have heard, I visited CAR with uh, Ambassador Samantha Power back in uh, December. And uh, we were horrified by what we saw there in terms of the intensity of, uh, of the hatred and the, and the killings that are taking place. Uh, we met with uh, government officials, we met with religious leaders, uh, and we met with ordinary people to talk about how we might better address this issue. Uh, we have committed to supporting the peacekeeping uh, efforts that are taking place right now in the CAR. We particularly thank the French government uh, for their efforts and the troops that they have put on the ground. And we're particularly uh, grateful for the African troops uh, that have been provided by the neighboring countries to help bring a level of security back to CAR. But ultimately, the uh, security uh, uh, situation can only be addressed by the people of CAR themselves. And I uh, use this opportunity to call upon the people of CAR to end the violence, to find a way forward uh, to, to peace. I spoke with uh, the new interim uh, president, uh, Catherine, Catherine uh, uh, Panza Samba, uh, after she was selected. Uh, I encouraged her to move forward in uh, uh, preparing for elections to take place no later than February of 2015. Uh, we have provided more than $100 million in support to uh, the peacekeeping efforts. With this funding, we airlifted uh, Rwandan and Burundian troops. We provided equipment and training, and we continue uh, to support those efforts. We have, in addition, provided uh, this year alone $45 million in humanitarian support. And we will continue to support efforts until uh, an ultimate solution is found for, uh, for the situation in CAR. The next question comes from News Agency of Nigeria. At the, at the just ended 22nd summit at the AU, President Mohamed Abdelaziz of Mauritania was elected the new AU chairman. In what ways will the U.S. cooperate with the new chairman to address several ongoing crises in, on the continent? We have a long and abiding relationship with the AU since the creation of the AU. And uh, we actually have an ambassador to the AU separate from our bilateral ambassador uh, to further that engagement. Uh, last year, we signed an MOU uh, that lays out areas of cooperation that we hope to have with the AU in the future. And we've had high level dialogues and those will continue. Uh, it is our hope, uh, along with uh, uh, the AU leadership, that we can work together to build the capacity of the AU to respond uh, to the crises that are occurring in Africa. But more importantly than that, we also want the AU uh, to be a voice of reason on the continent as the AU looks to how Africa, with its immense uh, resources, uh, can contribute to, uh, to the peace and prosperity of the people uh, in the countries that are members of the AU. Next question is from Radio Victoire. What is the contribution of the U.S. to the Gulf of Guinea countries, especially Togo, as far as the fight against maritime piracy is concerned? We're very strongly engaged with the Gulf of Guinea uh, countries, and I met with the uh, uh, Togolese foreign minister last week, and that was one of the topics on, uh, on his agenda. Uh, in fact, he talked about uh, the successes that uh, Togo has had in the Gulf of Guinea 
and I noted to him that we are committed to supporting the efforts of Togo as well as all the other countries in the in the Gulf of Guinea to deal with issues of piracy, uh, oil bunkering, and oil theft, and also to help uh, support and secure uh, the oceans that uh, surround the countries in the Gulf of Guinea. Our next question comes from the Daily Monitor. Does the United States government support the unilateral deployment by Uganda of its troop into, troops into South Sudan to prop up President Kiir's faltering government? Or did Kampala officials consult with Washington as strong allies on regional security? Uh, thank you very much for that question. And you know that that's a very prescient question given the situation that's taking place in South Sudan today. Uh, the, uh, first, let me say that we're, we were very, very pleased with the signing of the cessation of, of hostilities. It's still a work in progress, and one of the elements of that uh, cessation is that all troops from uh, all countries that may be supporting either side uh, pull their troops back uh, to uh, a defensive position. Uh, the IGAD uh, countries who have been supporting the, uh, the negotiations uh, supported Uganda's uh, decision as well as uh, the request of the South Sudanese government uh, for Uganda to come in and provide uh, security for, uh, for the infrastructure, the important infrastructure such as the airport and the road uh, between Uganda and, and Juba. And uh, the Ugandans came in at the request of the government and with the support of the IGAD countries. Now that a cessation of hostilities has been signed, uh, we, uh, along with others, call on Uganda as well as other governments to uh, pull back so that we can move the peace process forward and give the people of, of South Sudan what they have fought for uh, for more than 30 years. You heard what the secretary said. We contributed to, uh, to the efforts to build this new country. We're vested in this country's success. We want to see uh, the people of South Sudan who voted uh, for, for peace three years ago achieve that peace and move forward in prosperity. Al Hassan Sella of the BBC wants to know, the American government played a significant role in holding of both the presidential elections in 2010 and parliamentary elections in 2013 in Guinea, a feat that now makes Guinea a democratic state. Has Guinea gained any new level in U.S. Has Guinea gained any new level in U.S. Guinea relationships? Well, let me just say that uh, democracy. Uh, free, fair, and transparent elections are a high priority of, uh, of the U.S. government. And yes, we were very, very supportive of the efforts uh, in Guinea uh, to have free and fair elections in 2010 as well as in, in 2013. Uh, democracy is a process. It's not an end state. Uh, we all have worked every day to continue to improve our democracy, and we're working with the government of Guinea to uh, move forward and progress as, as a democratic state. Uh, this is key to prosperity, it's key to the success uh, of, of this country, and it's key to uh, the future of the people of Guinea. So we will continue to support those efforts. Uh, I will note that there are 14 elections taking place on the continent of Africa this year alone. And we look forward to working with governments and working with people to ensure that those elections are free and fair and they represent what uh, the people of these countries want to achieve. And Guinea is one example. Uh, Madagascar I, I, is another example. And Mali is, is a great example where elections have been achieved. And we look forward to seeing the successes of these three countries uh, be shared with the 14 other countries that will have elections in 2014. Wow. Kevin Kelly wants to know, why do you think so much violence is occurring now in Africa? South Sudan, CAR, East DRC, Somalia, Mali. Does this suggest that the Afro-optimism rests on a shaky foundation? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, I think that it is so clear that there's so much to, to be optimistic about on the continent of Africa. 
yes we have some countries in africa where violence is taking place but we also have seen some success in the countries that you listed mali for example in just a matter of a year was able to have free and fair elections and start to move that country forward and and have reconciliation that we hope will cement the peace that the people of mali deserve i think the same situation in somalia somalia has almost been in the state of disrepair uh, for almost 20 years, and we're seeing that country move forward. Uh, CAR, of course, is, is uh, a country where we have serious concerns. South Sudan is a country where we have serious concerns. But there are 40-plus other countries in Africa where there's not fighting and there's not war. And uh, we need to build on the successes of these countries, help those countries that are, are having problems get out of, uh, of trouble, working closely with the, with the AU, with regional organizations, and with our partners uh, across the world. We hope that all of Africa can achieve peace uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this decade. But at the same time, we also have to work with those countries where we're seeing success. Ghana, for example, and I know that Ghana is uh, on, um, uh, on camera today, and uh, we look forward to working with, uh, with Ghana. We look forward to working with Liberia, where I served as ambassador for almost four years, a country that went through 14 years of, of war and a country that is now at peace. So I don't think violence is the descriptive word that we can use to describe Africa. I think optimism is, is where we are, and we hope to build on that optimism so that it, all of the countries in Africa uh, is infected with it. The next question comes from L'Express de Madagascar. What are the criteria to be fulfilled to normalize the cooperation between the U.S. and Madagascar? And what is meant by the U.S. mantra of a democratic government? That's a great question. Uh, I met with the president of Madagascar at the AU, and I also called him after the election. And they've taken, Madagascar and the people of Madagascar have taken the first step uh, to normalizing the relationship with the United States, and that is that they had a peaceful, free, and fair uh, election, and that they're moving forward uh, to take Madagascar uh, into the, uh, the countries where there are democratic governments. Uh, it is our policy that we do not support governments that have been overthrown uh, in an undemocratic way as the government of Madagascar had been overthrown. But the election, I think, is a step in the right direction. Uh, we look forward to working with the government as the new president uh, builds uh, his, his new government, his new cabinet. Uh, we have encouraged him that this new government should be one that is inclusive and that reconciliation takes place uh, in the future so that Madagascar does not experience the kind of setback that it experienced over the past five years. Moses Wallowberry from New Vision says, it's, over, it's been over three years since President Barack Obama sanctioned the deployment of U.S. elite forces to help in the hunt for the remnants of Joseph Kony's LRA rebels, MCAR. Has the, pen, has the Pentagon set a definite deadline within which to accomplish the mission, mission or, operation, or is the operation open-ended? I think there's no deadline, there's a commitment. There's a commitment to seeing this to, to the end. Uh, and I think we've had tremendous progress. How often are we reading on the news about uh, some of the atrocities that uh, Kony uh, was committing a few years ago? They're on the run, and they're on the run because we're achieving success there. And we will be there until total success is, is achieved, and uh, there's no deadline on that. Our next question comes from Innocent Odo from Blueprint. Since the U.S. designated Boko Haram as foreign terrorist organization, the group has become rather more daring and killing more people. Is the U.S.-Nigeria strategy to combat this menace really working? I think Boko Haram has always been uh, daring. They are not more daring because we made a decision to, uh, to sanction them. Uh, we are working very, very closely with the government of Nigeria to address uh, the issue of violent extremism in Nigeria. Uh, we've had a number of meetings with the government. We're encouraging the government 
uh, to continue its efforts, and we're supporting, we're supporting the, those efforts. We think that to address uh, extremism, uh, there has to be a multifaceted uh, approach, one that brings in not only security and military elements, but also brings in civilian elements to deal with what might be uh, issues that people have in, in this area that has led them to uh, perhaps be uh, more tolerant of, uh, of, of Boko Haram. So we want to continue to work with the government to ensure that Boko Haram does not continue to terrorize the people of northern Nigeria. And in fact, they are terrorizing people all over Nigeria because uh, every individual that they attack uh, is also a member of the, the, the uh, citizens of, of the country of, of Nigeria. So everyone is impacted by what they are doing. And we are hoping that as we uh, continue to work with the Nigerian government, that eventually we will bring uh, this terrorism to, to an end. The journalist from fullnews.info would like to know, how would the U.S. assess the Islamic and fundamentalist threat affecting Nigeria and the Sahel? What is the guarantee that the threat will not affect the rest of West Africa in the coming years? I think we, we have, again, a multifaceted approach to this issue. Uh, we believe that countries that are strong democracies, uh, countries that respect human rights, uh, countries that provide opportunities uh, for their people, uh, countries that are economically prosperous and uh, create jobs for their people, uh, can resist the threat of, uh, of extremism. And so we're working through uh, our own uh, policies uh, to address these issues across Africa. And I think we are achieving a, a great deal of success even in Nigeria. Uh, I was recently in Nigeria and I was uh, very um, uh, pleased with the, the level of uh, of uh, progress, particularly uh, in Lagos, as I saw new businesses sprouting up, uh, young people who were excited about the future, and we just need to continue to build on those those successes throughout uh, throughout the continent, uh, so that extremism does not take root. The next, we're going to stick with Nigeria. Godwin Abunde from Liberty Radio wants to know. Don't you think that pressurizing Nigeria on the same-sex marriage act that has just been signed into law by the president, which represents the aspiration of 90 percent of Ni Nigerians, could amount to interference in Nigerian affairs? Uh, absolutely not. As a government, uh, it is one of our highest priorities and our strongest values that uh, discrimination against anyone uh, based on their sexual orientation, based on their gender identity, based on any uh, identification is wrong. Uh, we believe that human rights are, uh, are, should be available to all people. And uh, as a policy, uh, we will continue to, to press the government of Nigeria as well as uh, other governments who have uh, 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 provided legislation that discriminates uh, against the LGBT community. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, very much a work in progress, but I think you will agree that the, uh, the law in Nigeria uh, really uh, went uh, quite far in, uh, in, in um, discriminating uh, against this community, but also discriminating against people who are associated uh, with this community. So we will continue to press the government uh, and to press the legislature. Uh, to change these laws and provide human rights to all Nigerian people, regardless of their sexual orientation. The next question comes from Edmund S Smith Asante from the Daily Graphic in Ghana. Having followed the recent AU summit, do you think Africa is doing much in managing its own affairs? And how would you rate Ghana's performance in keeping the peace on the African continent? And what more does it have to do and are there any plans from the American government to help Ghana rescue its fa falling cred? Uh, I'm not sure of what the falling cred is, uh, but uh, let me just say that, uh, we're, as I said earlier, we're working very, very closely with the African Union uh, to address uh, uh, its own commitment to Africa's future. Uh, the AU summit uh, this year focused on agriculture. 
we are very uh, connected and very involved in agriculture throughout the continent because this is about building a future for, uh, for Africa. Uh, Ghana has played a key role in the AU. Ghana continues to play a key role in, in the region. Uh, Ghana provides uh, peacekeeping troops uh, uh, across the continent. Uh, they are in, uh, see, uh, in, in the neighbor, in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Ghana has recently provided troops that are in South Sudan. Uh, so again, I don't know what the falling cred is, is about, but it's I not, think... It's the falling SETI? Is that their money? Oh, CD. CD. Okay, yes. Uh, you know, this is, uh, again, it's, uh, we're, we're having economic issues in, in the United States, but we're certainly supporting countries to help build their economy so that uh, their economies uh, can uh, address some of the many issues that they have. So again, we're working with Ghana as well as other countries on that issue. So thank you for so, clarifying. I totally <laughs> misread that. Sorry about that. Our next question comes from the news agency of Nigeria in Abuja. How many African leaders have been invited to the African-U.S. summit in August, and why did the U.S. government withhold an invitation to President Mugabe of Zimbabwe? Uh, here's what our decision was. Uh, we invited all of the countries that were in uh, good standing with the AU and good standing with the United States government. So that's uh, the reason that invitations went out to certain countries and did not go to, to other countries. Okay, our next question comes from our very own bullpen member, Joe Biddle from the AFP. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon yesterday spoke with French Foreign Minister Fabius about increasing the number of European and African troops for MISCA forces in CAR. Would the U.S. support such a move and even consider sending any American forces? And as French President Hollande meets with President Obama in Washington, how important has the French role been in both CAR and Mali and in the Sahel region? Well, let me start with your last question. The, the French role has been key uh, to achieving success in Mali and the French role in trying to bring about uh, security and peace in, in CAR are very, very important, and we are very supportive of, of their efforts, uh, both in Mali as well as in, in CAR. Uh, we agree uh, that the number of troops in CAR need to be increased to address the uh, uh, very complex uh, security situation that is existing in that country, and I commend the African governments who have committed uh, their troops to uh, those peacekeeping efforts. Uh, right now, we're at uh, close to 6,000, and we think that additional security forces are required, including foreign police units that will help uh, secure uh, Bangui in particular, but also will get out into communities so that people feel safe in their communities. So we uh, hope to continue to work with the uh, troop contributing countries and will uh, continue to work with the French government and our partners in the European Union uh, to ensure that uh, we bring about uh, uh, a level of support that will bring peace and security to CAR. Our next question comes from Rwanda TV. Rwanda says MONUSCO and the UN Intervention Brigade are slow to attack FDLR in East Kivu. What do you make of this assertion? Uh, I've heard this, uh, this assertion, and we have uh, worked uh, closely with MINUSCA and its leadership uh, to address this issue. Uh, we agree that all of uh, the uh, uh, forces inside of uh, DRC who are bringing about instability need to be, uh, need to be attacked and need to be uh, brought uh, uh, to justice and we're encouraging MINUSCA as well as the IB to, uh, to address that concern of the Rwandans. But it's not just FDLR, there are other uh, uh, insurgencies inside that also need to be addressed. The next question comes from Carolyn Madoshi from The Guardian. African society is mostly rural communities depending on mainly agricultural activities. By improving the agriculture as well as agricultural economy, the basic African society can be elevated from poverty and hence enjoy the rest of the inputs. How can the American government or people help put our country, Africa, in our country, Africa, to acquire utilities such as electricity, water supply, and transport roads via the Millennium Challenge account? 
Uh, well, more than just the Millennium Challenge account, because the Millennium Challenge account will go to a single country. But let me talk about uh, Power Africa, uh, where the president uh, announced that we, we are committed uh, to bringing uh, electricity uh, to uh, 80 uh, million people across the continent of Africa who've not had access to, to electricity. And we are very, very committed to working with the six countries who are now a part of Power Africa, but we're also looking at how we address power requirements on, in, in other countries in, in the continent. And we think if, if power is, is available, that we will see other areas uh, rise as well, other infrastructure. We'll see more investments. We'll see education uh, improve. We'll see health care improve uh, if there's electricity in, in rural areas. So we're committed uh, to ensuring that uh, we assist African countries and we work with the private sector to bring electricity across the continent of Africa. MCC is just one component of that. But there are other elements that I think are, are equally important that will uh, see us to success in this area. The next question comes from QFM Radio in Lusaka. What tangible benefits has AGOA brought to African countries such as Zambia? And are there any plans to extend it beyond the 2015 deadline? I think that's the question that everybody has. Uh, we are working diligently here with our Congress to extend AGOA. Uh, in, uh, in 2015, and I'm optimistic. In fact, I'm confident that we will extend uh, AGOA, uh, and we have worked with a number of African countries who feel very, very strongly, including yours, that AGOA has brought uh, tremendous benefits to Africa by encouraging uh, the production of products that can be brought into the United States duty-free. We've seen a significant increase in uh, the level of imports uh, to the United States through AGOA, and uh, it has, uh, I think, uh, been one of our success stories for, uh, for the United States. It has uh, bipartisan support, uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, uh, before 2015 expires, we'll, we'll have uh, the AGOA extension uh, completed. We're going to stay within the region for Zambia. Mark Sumwewe at the African Union, he says, at the African Union summit recently held in Addis, African leaders reportedly resolved not to attend the European Union AU summit scheduled for Brussels in April if Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe will not be invited. What does the U.S. think about this common resolution by African leaders? Uh, I'm not uh, aware of that resolution. I uh, did uh, hear while I was at the EU uh, that uh, Zimbabwe would be invited to the uh, EU AU summit, and uh, I, I was pleased that they were able to resolve the issue. Okay. Tammy Holtman wants to know, can you please comment on the discussions in Washington last week with President Mkibi? Is that how you say it? Mbiki? Sorry. Thabo Mkibi. Mbeki. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. At the ECA panel on illicit financial flows from Africa, and what more the U.S. government and corporations can do to help curb them? Well, thank you for, for that question. I, I did meet with uh, President Mbeki and, and, and his team when they were here in Washington, and we're very, very supportive of their efforts and very encouraging of their efforts, and uh, we committed to working with them to help them uh, continue to build the capacity to address this issue uh, across the continent of Africa. They told me that somewhere around $50 uh, billion dollars, uh, is lost every year in uh, illicit transfers of, of money or lack of reporting of, of income on, on the continent. So we, we want to help uh, them address this issue and look forward to seeing positive results from, from their efforts. Brazzaville journalist wants to know, there is a humanitarian crisis taking place in CAR, and the U.S. is fully aware of it. What is the U.S. doing to bring back peace in CAR? Uh, that is the perfect way of addressing that question because the issue is not the humanitarian, uh, which is the result of, a, uh, of, of the security situation and the lack of peace in this country. And we are working very, very closely uh, with the countries in the region, uh, with the AU, with the UN, 
uh, to uh, help bring about peace in this country and supporting the efforts of the interim government to uh, move forward to, to have elections. Uh, I have uh, spoken to leaders in the region uh, on many occasions and, and, and encouraged them uh, in their efforts to help find a solution there. And we are working directly with the government and directly uh, with, uh, with the neighbors to help to find a solution. Uh, this is a, a result of, uh, of uh, uh, lack of governance over many, many years. And to address this issue is going to require a lot of effort on the part of, uh, of the neighbors as well as uh, the international community. We're committed to finding uh, a solution uh, to the situation in CAR. And at the time, uh, while we're working on finding a solution, we're also supporting the humanitarian effort. Uh, we, as I uh, indicated, uh, this year alone we've committed $45 million. I think our total since the situation started is around $75 million to address these efforts. Uh, we had a team from USAID visit CAR recently, and they're looking at ways that we can provide more assistance. This is along the exact same lines. It comes from Krista Larson. The United States and others are placing a lot of faith in the African peacekeepers to stabilize the Central African Republic. In recent days, though, there have been a series of violent lynchings where they have failed to intervene. What more should be done to stem the escalating violence in CAR? Uh, those, those reports were horrifying. Uh, and uh, it just uh, highlighted for me and others uh, how uh, urgent uh, the situation is there and how important it is that we work with, uh, uh, with the AU and uh, the French forces and EU forces who are coming to uh, provide stability and security in the country so that they can start uh, building on, uh, on, on those efforts and, and find a solution uh, that will bring peace to to, uh, to the people of CAR. When we were in CAR back in, in December, uh, we started to see the rising levels of frustration that people uh, express because of the lack of, uh, of, uh, of security in, in CAR. And we know that one of the important elements that we have to work on is how we uh, find justice for those people who have been the victims of uh, the atrocities uh, that have been committed. So we're working uh, closely uh, with the African, uh, with the, uh, African Union and, and with others to, to try to build up the security forces there. Uh, we, as, as I mentioned, uh, airlifted Rwandan and Burundian troops. We are bringing in equipment uh, to support those efforts. We're encouraging uh, a peace process and reconciliation we have uh, issued messages and spoken uh, with uh, various parties, including those who are supporting the violence to say that the violence must stop. Uh, we're telling them clearly and openly and boldly that they will be held accountable for any violence that uh, is committed in, in this country. Uh, it is still uh, a, a serious situation. We're not uh, yet at a place where we feel any level of comfort but it is not uh, due to lack of effort. Uh, we're all working uh, uh, closely as a community uh, to address this issue. Our next question comes from the U.S. Embassy in Dakar. How far is the Obama administration ready to go for the respect of gay rights on the continent? And where are people mostly against this issue? Well, I, I think uh, we, you've seen in the press uh, where uh, there have been major problems in, uh, in Nigeria and Uganda. Uh, and in other locations, but I think if you look at what is happening in the United States, you can determine how far we, we are willing to go. We uh, strongly believe, we strongly support human rights for all people, and we particularly are opposed to uh, legislation that actually uh, targets uh, the gay community, the LGBT community, uh, for uh, uh, discrimination. So we're prepared to push this as a uh, arm of our, our policy, not just in Africa, but across the world. We've had issues on, uh, on, we've had concerns on this issue in other places in the world. It's not just Africa. Uh, it's, it's in the United States, and our laws have uh, been developed so that we can protect the human rights of L the LGBT community here, and we also want to encourage that in our foreign policy and our approach to uh, governments in Africa. 
Christine Haguma wants to know, what are the U.S. contributions to strengthen the African Union capacity? Uh, great question. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, have, we signed an MOU uh, with the AU last year. Uh, we have an ambassador on the ground who is engaging with the AU on a regular basis, on a daily basis at, at, a, at a high level. Uh, we have uh, high-level uh, dialogues with the AU. We have uh, created a number of working groups that are working with the AU to address a broad range of, of issues, and we will con continue to consult with the AU as uh, we approach uh, some of the many issues, uh, both positive, such as agriculture, and negative, such as, uh, as violence and, and car, uh, to seek uh, the AU's advice and partner with the AU to address those problems and also build on uh, on the progress that we see taking place is taking place in other parts of uh, of the continent. Okay, so we're going to stay with that theme right now. And Galaxy TV in Lagos wants to know what measures are being put in place by the U.S. government to help the AU tackle security challenges and curb illicit arms trafficking across the continent. And what is the state of the partnership between the U.S. and Africa? And how does the U.S. manage conflicting issues with these partners, i.e. bad governance and corruption, which are the major causes of conflict in Africa as a whole? And what is the U.S. government doing to mitigate these issues? Wow. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. I'm not sure I'm going to remember them all, but I'll just start with partnership. And uh, when we talk about our partnership with the continent of Africa, we are sincere in that partnership. And it is not a partnership that just started. It's, it's, an, it's a partnership that has a historical basis and uh, goes through many, many uh, generations. I think uh, the president's trip to Africa this summer highlighted how important that partnership is. We're building on, uh, on that through uh, a number of initiatives. Uh, let me just name a few that you've heard uh, quite a lot about. Uh, Power Africa, Trade Africa, uh, AGOA, uh, the Young Africa uh, Leaders Initiatives. Uh, these are all efforts to, to build on, on that partnership. We're working with the continent on health uh, issues, on education issues, and then equally uh, important to us is democracy and governance and uh, ensuring that there are free, fair, and transparent uh, elections that take place across the continent so that this continent with so many resources can continue to grow and continue to uh, build on, uh, on its success. Next question comes from Vanguard. China appears to be making inroads in economic sphere where America once was dominant. Is the U.S. worried? And again, most African countries now doing business with China has argued that America's stance on corruption, unlike the Chinese, make it easier to deal with the Chinese. What's your view on this? Well, I'll turn that back to you. So, uh, so what I think you're saying is that uh, it's okay for uh, corruption to take place to encourage uh, companies to invest in Africa, and we don't buy that. Uh, we think it is so important that countries are transparent, uh, that efforts that take place in those countries provide an opportunity for, uh, for the people of, of those continents. So we're not going to change our stance on corruption because we think it's, uh, it, it gives an unfair advantage to uh, Chinese companies. I think those companies are going to come to realize that they cannot operate uh, securely and safely and, uh, and, and, and prosperously in countries where corruption exists. And, and our hope is that they too will uh, as ascribe to our concerns about corruption on the continent. Uh, we know that Africa uh, is uh, not defined by corruption. And we know that there are companies that are investing in the continent who are contributing to the well being of the countries that they're working in. And those are the countries that we want to work in. And we are encouraging American investment. We demand a fair playing uh, field for, for our companies. Uh, having served as ambassador to Liberia, I worked uh, regularly with American companies to ensure that they were able to invest uh, in a warm and welcoming and friendly way on the continent of Africa. If uh, this continent is going to continue to build uh, the resources that they, the immense resources that are available, uh, then the continent is going to have to open up. It's going to have to be transparent. Uh, it's going to have to have a free, uh, a free marketplace that allow for all companies to, uh, to, to invest. 
We have time for one more question. Right. <laughs> Comes from Peter Fabricius from the Foreign Editor of Independent Newspapers in South Africa. Do you think that President Jacob Zuma's appointment of the Deputy ANC President and his special envoy to South Sudan will add value to the many med mediators and special envoys already in the field? And if so, what value? Uh, there are a number of special envoys that are working on South Sudan. As you know, we have a special envoy. The EU has a special envoy. AU has a special envoy. The Chinese have a special envoy. And the South Africans have a special envoy. And I'm sure I forgot some. And every single one of them have contributed uh, to helping uh, to find a solution for, uh, for peace in, in South Sudan. Again, it's a work in progress. We're all working together to help the people of, of South Sudan achieve peace. So I commend uh, President Zuma for naming a special envoy. It, uh, I think, outlines his commitment to seeing that peace and prosperity uh, uh, is brought to, uh, to South Sudan. So thank you. Thank you. This is number three for you, and yeah. we always love to have you. So that concludes today's program. A full video and audio transcript and uh, download link will be provided to you shortly after the conclusion of the program today. If you would like to continue this conversation, you can do so on Facebook and Twitter using the hashtag USAfrica. I thank you for joining us and I look forward to doing this again.